Hello, this is Bill McKay with IoT Recruiting. Welcome to IoT Recruiting Podcast number six. We are pleased to be joined today by Jeff Cavanaugh, Senior Partner at Emphasis and ad- Adjunct Professor at University of Texas at Dallas and with a specialization in design, innovation, and manufacturing strategy. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Bill. Glad to be here. Super. Jeff, could you tell us a little bit about your role in relation to some of the things that are happening in the industry with digital transformation, Internet of Things, that kind of thing? Could you explain us a little bit about your role and kind of what you're doing for clients in that area? Yeah, I'd love to. As you mentioned, a partner with Infosys Consulting and focusing in the manufacturing area, so working with clients um, who make things, automotive, industrial, and they're, they're, they're caught up a, quite a bit in this this. Um, sort of disruptive forces that are affecting all industries, but manufacturer, I think, is being affected as much as any because what used to be a fairly slow-moving design cycle, you'd, you'd release a product, you'd put it out there, very defined product cycle, and markets move fairly slowly. It's, it's accelerated to the point where things must change quickly, and the software industry has kind of gotten used to that or they, they can deal with that. But for physical products, it's hard to change that fast. So in some respects, because manufacturing has such a physical dimension to it, it's really put pressure on these um, manufacturing companies. And ironically, some of the ones that were the most iconic and had the strongest branding, like the the GEs of the world and the Toyotas and the others, are being affected as much as any because it's hard to change. It's even harder to change when you're large and you have assets, manufacturing plants, products that take two or three years to develop. So it's been uh, a challenge and also very exciting working with these clients because um, the impact is huge about adding, for lack of a better word, digital into their manufacturing, both customer-facing, how they work with customers, how they work with the market and understand what's needed, and also internally, how do they connect all their their uh, their equipment, their plants, uh, how do they make sense of all that data, how do they integrate, and how, how do they work globally and yet get very detailed and um Opt- optimized locally. So a lot of interesting things going on uh, in addition to, to working with these clients, helping them either to think about new strategies or how to implement the strategies they have, uh, or maybe how to overcome uh, missteps or, or uh, challenges they have in the market. In addition, uh, I also look at our own uh, company and how we attract and, and develop talent. How, and then also for our clients, how do we look at knowledge? How do we look at uh, education and training? Because besides all these technologies, we still have people. And how do, the, how, how do people learn and how do they become more effective in this uh, very rapidly evolving and disruptive set of, set of trends we have upon us? Great. What are, uh, what are some of the specific, two or three specific challenges you see your companies facing in this rapid evolving market? And how do you think they're adapting at this point in time? One is almost an existential challenge. We all expect more and more from technology more features, more goodies. We want them faster and at less cost. Heck, you, on your apps, on your mobile phone, your smartphone, you've got all these really neat features and apps that you don't pay for, or if you do, it's very little. And yet, as a company, providing these products and services, that's frightening because what maybe a company could charge $1,000 before or 500 or, or hundreds, all of a sudden now everybody wants them for free, like information services, for example used to charge a lot of money for these research services. Well, now anyone would just go on and do on a web search and get a lot of information. So I think that's one fundamental challenge. As consumers demanding such, such, you know, such high expectations and as providers wanting to serve customers, but at the same time, you've got to be economically viable. So that's one challenge. I think the other is that's expectation gaps. And then the other is more of a um, acceleration of cycles or collapsing of uh, product life cycles, where in the past there would be between the stimulus or, or the, the acknowledgement of a requirement in the market and your ability to design for it and build and deliver, there'd be a certain amount of time. Well, the, the time that customers used to allow you to do that, maybe like for vehicles, they'd accept that every five years there'd be a new vehicle model or for some other products, maybe less, but still a defined amount. Now, that's not enough time. And by the time you design for that need, the market has changed before you ever get it to the public. And that is an existential threat because the only people who will do well in that environment are the ones who can respond very quickly. And maybe the small companies who don't have quite the asset base or the, the, the legacy interests that they have to serve. Like, for example, if, if you're on 
version ABC of something and it's certain speed, you might not want to go to the next version because you have all this investment in the current one and you have to recoup that. Whereas some other company might start with that new technology, that faster chip, that better technology, that better network service, whatever it is. So I think that challenge about having to move more and more quickly. And I guess the third is if data and information is the new oil, if it's so important and there's so much of it now we're tapping into, the challenge is, so what? How do you get value from it? The fact that you can analyze, maybe even make things pretty through visualization, how do you actually monetize it? I mean, that is on top of mind for all the executives we, we work with and I work with. How do you actually get money from it? The fact that you can run a predictive analysis, the fact that you can pull data off sensors, the fact that you can track, uh, say, foot traffic and, 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 and what's going on in malls or shopping patterns, that's great. But how do you make money for it and how do you uh, monetize that? People are still grappling with that. Those are the three things I really see as macro trends people are faced with. Great. One of the things that's often mentioned is the people aspect of this and, and the impact on people, not only within organizations, but obviously outside of organizations. What skills do you think are needed to stay relevant for this disruptive age? And do you think people and companies are actually ready for that disruption? It's a huge question because even if, and it's irrelevant, and I'm glad you asked it, even if someone is trained up or has the skills today, if, if those skills change tomorrow or the next month, the next quarter, then you're not relevant. And think about those that might spend a month or a year or longer being certified in something or getting a degree or a new skill. By the time you finish it, is it relevant? Uh, and and should, you, are you always, should you always be chasing the new skill? Or should you go double down and be very, very deep in one thing, even though it might become obsolete? That's something that, uh, that bothered me that um, you could train for something. I see all these people, whether it's going to night school, you know, uh, getting their, their, their advanced degrees, whether it's getting certifications in certain technologies, whatever it is, and not being able to get the full value from it. So I did some research. As you mentioned, uh, faculty at University of Texas at Dallas and the grad school there, I did some research on just the market, surveyed 10,000 employers, recruiters and employers, 3,000 business school students, and 500 career center leaders from universities and colleges, and asked them, what are the skills that people need the most? And the ones that came up, critical thinking, creativity, professionalism, we adults call that work ethic, but you know, professionalism, IT, um, and you know, communications is, is pretty important, or unwritten. That was pretty much standard. What was very interesting, though, is the gap on the perceived ability of graduates coming out of school and their readiness to thrive in the workforce. Students and their career center uh, leaders rated themselves significantly higher in these skills than the recruiters. There's a discernible gap in how the university students and the universities thought they were preparing students in these areas relative to what the employers thought, which is one of the reasons why university or corporate um, corporations are putting boot camps in place. They're having to have more and more training. And in fact, the reason I was even over uh, on the faculty at UTD is that they saw something missing in the college. I give them credit. There are some colleges out there that are trying to rectify this gap. They, they saw that they are creating or, or, or graduating very competent technical uh, professionals. Quantitatively, they're sharp. They can use systems. They can analyze. But they couldn't tell a story or they didn't communicate as effectively or they couldn't discern the meaningful insights from all the sea of data. And as a result, I, I created a class for that. I've been teaching that and trying to, to spread the word. And trying to make as big of an impact as possible so people could take advantage of their technical skills, of, of all these nice trends and technologies that are out there. There's still some age-old skills that people give lip service to, and maybe a few decades ago, there were even liberal arts curriculums that focused on it. But as far as a business application of structured thinking, logic, uh, deductive and inductive, being able to arrange um, an argument, you know, critically think, not in a negative way, but critically developing an argument in the position and being very persuasive, backed by data, using visualizations, using all this plethora of sensor data that's out there. And so that's why with the course, with the teaching and development that I do at my own firm, um, have also converted all that experience as well as uh, insights from colleagues, uh, friends of mine, it's strategy firms, clients for exe executives in the market, and created a full book on the topic 
because it was simply missing out there. In fact, I went looking for something similar as a textbook for my class in college, and there was none. So, so I created one. And that is something that uh, I'm proud to say is actually being released uh, in April 2018. So hopefully any of your listeners that uh, have an interest uh, might be able to use that as a foundation to help build their own set of skills. That's super. I'd like to say, did this surprise you based on what you've seen? And then what can people do to future-proof their career and take advantage of the promise of some of these new technologies? What does your research tell you in that area? On the one hand, it was surprising because there is so much information available. Now that you have the Internet and Google and Bing and all these search engines, everyone should be a genius, right? What used to be – I know we're dating ourselves a little bit here, Bill – but yeah, early in our careers – it was a real feat to get the right information. Either you went to a library or you, you subscribed to the right trade journals uh, or you had a network of people and you knew who to call. Uh, it was only you know, the Internet came into being. And even then, the first wave of that was not terribly useful. The last several years, though, it's amazing the amount of good information that's either inexpensive or free that is available to people. Uh, and I think just, just training the mental muscle so they have it available. So it was surprising, but then as I taught the courses at University of Texas and as I worked with thousands of our own consultants and as I recruited and sat across the desk from some of the top students as candidates, you know, higher from MBA and master's programs and undergraduate as well, the pattern emerged where that, that rote knowledge has become so prevalent that some, uh, many of the students coming out, although they're, they're, they're intelligent, there's a dimension of this critical thinking that just wasn't developed. And it's not to mention that the colleges aren't aware of it. They've been inundated with this, this um, emphasis on STEM skills. People need to learn to code. People need to learn to analyze, learn to you know Python, R, and all these new tools do. So what happens is in a finite curriculum, you only have so many courses. Get all your required courses. There are only so many variables or so many um, – options for people to take. So I think it's a matter of priorities. And how do you introduce some of these skills? And yet, when someone hears about critical thinking, they don't roll their eyes and think about Plato and Seneca and people that they think are you know, these dusty old Roman and, and, and Greek uh, philosophers. How do you take, and by the way, these, these, these things are timeless principles. How do you inject that with the people like the Edward Tufties and Stephen Few and the others who have these visualization concepts that really bring these things to life? And then you, you can bring um, bring to bear all the power of these analytical engines uh, of, of machine learning, artificial intelligence. I think that's it did surprise me because there's this concept of the paradox of choice where you're truly uh, par paralyzed almost because you have so many choices in front of you and you either run around grabbing little bits of whatever's most you know, the shiny object or you just choose something and go deep but don't have a, a big picture, you know, clear picture of the the overall situation. So I was surprised. At the same time, uh, I'm encouraged because there is a lot of information out there. I think people, genuinely, speak, genuinely speaking, they've got a work ethic. They just want to get a good sense of what the lay of the land is and an approach for it. And I think when they get exposed to that and they realize it isn't so complex, you know, calm down a little bit, don't multitask quite so much, and then attack these uh, in, in a logical path, logical sequence. I think they also, their stress level goes down because there's this fear of missing out that also applies to technology and people try learning too much, too broadly, too deep. And so as a result, you don't really get too critical mass of anything. I think the right approach is have an appreciation across the board and then pick an area, probably where you're working today or probably an area of interest and then go deep. This T approach. So you do have an appreciation, broadly speaking, and then for at least one area, you can add some real value today to your employer, to yourself, to your client. I think that's fulfilling as well. So that's what I'm seeing. You mentioned you had a book coming out. Could you tell us briefly a little bit about your book and then how it kind of dovetails with some of the things we've been discussing and what avenues you might see for people to go in? Sure. Uh, the name of the book is Consulting Essentials. And I chose that title intentionally because although it's not just for consultants, these are relevant skills for any professional, this is what I consider to be the essential toolkit, the essential set of tools to help people become more consultative in their own work, either with customers or clients if they work with them, uh, just in general. Because that consultative approach is like a doctor. You diagnose, you take input, you have empathy for your customer, for your client, for the situation at hand, and you 
analyze and then derive an insight and apply it to solve a problem. And, and it just seems that everywhere that that's what's needed now. If it's rote, if it's operational, it's either outsourced or, or automated. So that's, that's, that's the book, uh, is released uh, mid April, April 16th, 2018. And it's a collection of skills with learnability, the, the ability to learn itself as a foundation. I mean, that is just a, having an intellectual curiosity and learning how to learn more effectively, learning faster, refreshing your, your knowledge, uh, learning from experts, conferences, documents, your own experience, being able to, to hone that where you can learn faster with less effort. I think that's a real skill. And then this set of foundational competencies, critical thinking, creative thinking, oral communication, written communication. And then this, this area that typically implies the consulting uh, mindset, frameworks and estimation. Frameworks, uh, you, can be, you can think of them as mental scaffolding. They help you set up a problem, a situation before you have all the details. It's a great place to start. And in consulting firms, we use them a lot because maybe there is a, a junior consultant working on something and a framework is how to do it and it embeds all the the knowledge or much of the thinking and insights from a very senior practitioner, maybe a partner who's done that a hundred times, and they can start with it. So frameworks are important. We've all seen them. Uh, one of the board members on my previous firm, Dr. Michael Porter of, of Harvard Business School fame, uh, his five forces model, that's a good example of a framework. Uh, my firm has one we call the value realization method. It's a way to frame how business value Monetary value is, is created, how it's linked. Uh, there are many frameworks. Periodic table of the elements, you think about it, that's a framework. Uh, it's more than that, but it's a good, anyway. And then the estimation, the ability to quickly get a handle, you know, uh, directionally speaking on a situation. So if I said, for example, what's 99 times 101? You get to think, maybe run for your calculator. But if I said, well, those are both close to 100, and 100 times 100 is 10,000, you're within 1% of the answer without even having having to um, do much analysis. In many problems, there's an initial stage called exploratory data analysis, where you just want to find out, am I in the right spot? Of the 10 places to look, is this the right place? Maybe you've got 10 products, and you're going to figure out profitability, and really only one or two are contributing to the problem. Uh, maybe it's customers. Maybe you're going to figure out where to put your sales dollars. All of us have to figure out how to spend our time. So exploratory analysis is really good. And just some rough estimations and the ability to do that and not get hung up and having kept all the facts and do lots of analysis that helps you get half the way there, maybe even 80% you know, in 20% of the time. And then you can spend your time and go really deep on the, on the areas that matter. So then in addition to that productivity and leadership, things like thought leadership, change management and uh, relationship and network leadership in a, in a business context. Those are what I would call those foundational competencies. No matter what your profession, you need to have those to have a good base. And then the book goes into what I call mastery or evolutionary competencies. These are new areas like uh, design thinking, data visualization, agile development and operations, uh, and then automation, artificial intelligence, and project-based thinking. These areas, they're newer. We know they're important. They're taking off. We don't exactly know which ones are going to be uh, the most prevalent, or maybe it's a combination of all of them. I treat them s smaller doses, uh, but want to give people a good overview of each one, how they relate. And then I have an appendix on what I call Consulting the Emphasis Way. It's a 15-page manifesto that we put together about what we think a professional services firm should be, what we should aspire to. And I think those tenants apply to anyone who's trying to become more professional and, and uh, develop excellence in their field. And then lastly, I put an appendix in, uh, how to excel in an interview. Sounds a bit strange, except a lot of people, they don't know what it's like to be on the other side of the desk. And after interviewing thousands of people, looking at tens of thousands of resumes over the years, there are certain elements that come out. So I thought it would be handy to, to include a, an appendix or a section on uh, what's going through the mind of that interviewer across the table from you. So that's what it is, Bill. Great. Thank you very much, Jeff. That's been very informative. Once again, the book is coming out on Monday, and we look forward to connecting with you in the future sometime. Thanks very much for your time, Jeff. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me.